DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, presents The Cavalcade of America. Tonight's star, Raymond Massey. Tonight's story, With Malice Toward None. <laughs> This is early afternoon of a drizzling, cloud-wracked day in Washington, D.C., the 4th of March, 1865, on the eve of victory for the North in the war between the states. Despite a downpour in the morning, a huge crowd has gathered before the portico of the Capitol building. They are waiting now, waiting as crowds do, pushing, talking, laughing. As we wait as well with them, we eavesdrop upon two citizens. What do you think he'll say, eh? What do you think he'll say? Oh, I'm sure I don't know. Since the war is almost over and almost won, I suppose General he'll be... General Grant will have him licked in a week. In a week. Then what? No mercy. That's what I say. No quarter to the rebels. Make them crawl. Starve them under the knees. Every man jack of them. That's what I say. And that's what he better say, too. Oh, I don't believe Mr. Lincoln will talk like that, my friend. I just don't believe he will. But, oh, here he is now. And, and look there, my friend. The sun is out. The clouds are broken. And the sun is out. There it is. Here's the president. Here's the president. Hello, country. Hello, countrymen. At this second appearing to take the oath of presidential office, there is less occasion for an extended address than there was at the first. The progress of our arms, upon which all else chiefly depends, is as well known to the public as to myself. And it is, I trust, reasonably satisfactory and encouraging to all. On the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, both parties, what is he thinking, what this gaunt, monstrously weary man, who has but a scant 40 days to live? This speech he had written out a week before the inaugural, as he pondered the terrible choices victory itself would bring to him. Figures far more powerful than the little man in the capital crowd would counsel revenge, a piece of fire in the sword. He remembers, perhaps, one such bloodthirsty gentleman... One we shall call Wesley Ford Thatcher. Thatcher. Yes, he remembers Thatcher. It was about a month before the inaugural, late in the evening, in Lincoln's office in the White House. Mr. President, I have come here to ask a most vital question. Sit down, Thatcher. Sit down. Please excuse my dish of billy, as the man called it. My vest seems to come undone somehow. Mr. Lincoln, I have come here on behalf of hundreds of your own constituents in New York and New Jersey to ask a most important question. Take care, man. All questions grow less vital when delivered from a sitting position. I found that out. Very well, then. This chair will do. But I must most respectfully warn you. That you sit up straight, right spang on the edge of it. Well, all right. That's your privilege, my friend. I trust you'll allow me to slump down a little. <clears throat> Sorry, Thatcher. You see, all along about this time of day, I start to come apart the scene. My vest rides up, my galluses lose their gimp, and my feet just naturally reach for the corner of the deck. You don't mind the slippers. Your friends, Mr. President, are by this time well used to your uh, remarkable appearance. May I count you, sir, among those few long-suffering martyrs? Martyrs? Among my friends? I have voted for you twice, Mr. Lincoln. As the lesser of two evils, perhaps? Possibly, sir. <laughs> but I carried with me into your column on election day many hundreds of thousands of votes. It is those good people I must speak for now. They are worried, Mr. President. A momentous question disturbs their minds and, I may say, their hearts. And the question is? I'll be blunt, sir, and completely open. Good. Good. And brief as well. Uh, uh, Jack, we want to know, Mr. President, 
Whether or not you are at this moment conducting shameful, secret, peace negotiations with Jefferson Davis in Richmond through the person of one F.P. Blair. The rumors are everywhere, sir. And sound men are everywhere left in the dark. We want to know... Is there one question at a time? And do sit down, Thatcher. So it's old man Blair that worries you. Our elder statesman. Yes, it is. Elder Medler, I'd call him. He frets me, too, at times. Well, I shall answer your question. But first, let me ask a single question of you. Mr. Thatcher, why do you want this war to go on? Because the rebels must be punished for their crimes. Their lands must be laid waste, their ships scuttled, their treasure forfeited. And their leaders must be hanged, sir, hanged by the neck until dead. It is the will of God, Mr. President. The will of God. All of you are so sure you know the will of God. I am the only one who does not know it. Well, you must learn it, Mr. Lee. From you, sir. Unless I am more deceived in myself than I often am, it is my earnest desire to know what the will of providence is. <clears throat> The President, I have asked you a question, if you please. Have you been conducting secret peace negotiations? No, sir. I have conducted no peace negotiations. Old man Blair has proceeded entirely upon his own authority. Well, at Blair's urging, Jefferson Davis yesterday sent a delegation to meet with General Grant. Just a few hours ago, I learned by telegraph that the meeting there had led to no results. The war will go on. Good. It is that news, I'm afraid, that has caused my... my extreme fatigue, Mr. Sack. But this is splendid news, Mr. President. Huh. It would not be considered so among the bivouacs and around the campfires of the men who have marched and suffered from Manassas through Gettysburg to the gates of Richmond. However, oh, that's probably John Nicolay, my secretary... Wants me to get some supper. Come in, John. Come in. Mr. President. Yes, John. Uh, Mr. President. Why, you're all of a cluster. Secretary Stanton's had another telegraph message from General Grant. Most important, he says. Most important, sir. And can you meet him at the war office telegraph room at once? Oh, to be sure, John. I guess Charlie Tinker down there can scare me up a bite to eat. Uh, if you will excuse me, Mr. Thatcher? Oh, certainly, certainly. I shall return home to Brooklyn much reassured, Mr. President, and I shall tell the voters whose confidence I have had the honor to inspire. Yes, yes, I'm sure you will, but I must get about the business of this war. This war you like so well, Mr. Thatcher. Come along, John. Charlie. Oh, good evening, Mr. President. Back again? Back again, Charlie. By urgent request of our boss, Secretary of War Stanton. Oh, fine. Seems to me. I spend about five times as many hours right here as I do anywhere else in town. <laughs> Where's Mr. Stanton? So he went up to his office there. He said he'd be right back down. Uh, your old chair, Mr. President? Yes, yes sir. Uh, I declare, Charlie, it's a pleasure to look at your honest face across the desk and listen to that key rattle. Thank you, sir. No, I'm among men who work for a living, not talk. 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 Well, we like to have you here with us, sir. I know you do. This is just about the one place in Washington where I can get loose and act as if I were back home on the Illinois circuit, lawyer in the game. You had any supper, Mr. President? No, Charlie. Things are... Sort of piled up on me all day long. Maybe you could do something about that. I already have, sir. You sent a boy out for sandwiches and coffee as soon as I heard you were coming back. <laughs> there, now, I swear. Telegraphers are my favorite people. <laughs> they know I got human insides and spite all the evidence to the contrary outside. <laughs> you stand. We'll catch it, Charlie. Good evening, Mr. President. Good evening, Stan. Uh, Good news? I'm afraid you'll think it's good news, Mr. Lincoln. I don't like it. Hmm. Must be very good news indeed. From Grant? Yes. Well, he's changed his mind about the peace deal from Jefferson Davis. 
saw the emissaries again just an hour ago. Tinker, is the last part of the message decoded? Mm, yes, sir. Wilson did it. Read it for you, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, here it is, sir. To Edwin M. Stanton, Secretary of War, War Office, Washington. After talking again with Alexander Stevens, Vice President of the Confederate Government, I am convinced his intentions are good and his desire sincere to restore peace and union. I am sorry Mr. Lincoln himself cannot have an interview with Stevens, if not with all three emissaries now within our line. I'm Ulysses S. Grant, Commander, Army of the Potomac. Gosh, mighty. Steve, so little Alec is there. Mr. President, you won't do anything hasty. You, you simply must not but do anything. I it. know the man Stanton. I know Alec Stevens well. We were in Congress together. He's a little pale-faced, consumptive man. Doesn't weigh more than 90 pounds, but he has the heart of a lion. They used to laugh at his littleness then, just as they laughed at my bigness. Mr. President, I must beg of you to do nothing without the consent of the Secretary of State, Seward. I beg of you, sir. Oh, I'll consult Seward. But, Stanton, I'm going down there myself. What? I'm going to see little Alex Stevens, and I'm going to talk peace with him. And I'm leaving at once. Charlie? Yes, sir. Get this in code and send it at once. Yes, sir. Tell General Grant I will see Alexander Stevens and his two companions. I will meet them as soon as I can get down river. Yes, sir. Keep us quiet, Stanton. Absolutely quiet. Of course. I'm leaving now. Oh, Charlie. Yes, Mr. President. I'm truly sorry to miss those sandwiches. That's the way it goes. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> Listening to the Cavalcade of America, starring Raymond Massey, sponsored by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Tonight on Cavalcade of America, Raymond Massey is starring as President Lincoln in With Malice Toward None. For two days, the President of the United States was missing from Washington with his Secretary of State. There were fewer reporters then, but the news seekers were just as avid. The news leaked. The guest in the White House saw the President hurry away and rushed to question John Nicolay, who knew nothing of Lincoln's departure. But the story spread. Still, for a few hours at least, the mission was secret. And as a small naval vessel moved down the Potomac to Chesapeake Bay, the president stared ahead across the widening waters. It's so clear to everyone else. It's written down in plain black and white to them. But to me, it's gray. Those who believe in a hard and violent peace are men of my own party. Honest men, most of them. My friends in all but this. They are many, I fear. The others are few. The men who think as I do. That somewhere this ever-recurring round of hatred must have a stop. And that a measure of forgiveness is the way to end it. And then there are those thousands in blue. Oh, God. Those almost countless poor lost thousands. Those who gave their lives in our cause. At my word. At my summoning. What is my duty to them? It is not a simple thing. Each way I turn, I am hemmed about by equal, opposite choice. What is thy will, O oh God? What is thy will? And in the morning, with the ship at anchor in Hampton Roads in Chesapeake Bay, near Fortress Monroe, the president receives a visitor. 
is Vice President Alexander Stevens of the Confederacy. As the tiny Stevens comes aboard and into Mr. Lincoln's cabin, he is swathed in a huge overcoat of rough gray Confederate homespun with many heavy shawls against the February cold. Hey, Alex. Alec, I'd never know you. What in the world are you wearing? Why, a great coat made for Hercules, Abe. Or for yourself and the seven veils of Salome. Here, yeah, help me unwind, old friend. Here we are. Now, <laughs> just, just to keep turning, Alec. Yes. <laughs> there, that's the last veil. Oh. And now, sir, allow me to assist you with the coat. <laughs> I declare, never have I seen so small a nubby a corn come out of so huge a hut. Oh, nonsense. <laughs> I've lost only two pounds since I saw you last. I weigh all of 93. <laughs> Let's see, Abe. <laughs> Sixteen years ago, those were better times. Oh, they were. But I cannot feel that either you or I have been responsible for the wasting, Abe. It was done in spite of us. I hope that's true. Now the question is, can we turn back the clock between? I've come to try. And so have I. But there are others. In a sense, my friend, I am many times a prisoner. A prisoner of other men's convictions and my <laughs> august position. <laughs> Nor am I free. We haven't much time, my friend. Neither of us. We haven't much time. So you feel that too? I've never told anyone, not even Mary. That death is near you? Yes, I know. Death is a friend in my house, too, Abe. He's lived with me in rack and fever long years now. I've known him only lately, but I know him well and true. You'll find him a good friend, Abe. Well, we've come to talk of peace, Abe, not death. And the others are waiting in the wardroom. All right. Oh, Alex. Yes, Abe. There are many things I must say officially, things I must say, the stand I must take. I understand. I'm burdened in a like manner by my instruction and by the dead men in gray, by Stonewall Jackson and Colonel Ashby and Pickett's men, Abe, by the soldiers of my own state, the men of Georgia, who have preceded me in great numbers to a final peace. They are all around us. Blue and gray. Yes. And you know, Abe, I think they would not ask too much, only that we try. It is harder for you, of course, since you will be the victim. We'll try to get it. Come, let's join the others. <laughs> So, gentlemen, I think I've made myself clear. Our points are three. One, a restoration of the national authority throughout all the state. Two, no receding on the slavery question from the position I made clear in my last annual message to Congress. Three, no cessation of hostility short of an end of the war and the disbanding of all forces hostile to the government. Uh, that is your official position, Mr. Lincoln? That is my position, Mr. Stevens. And God help me, I can take no other. Yes. May I, uh, may I suggest, gentlemen, that we take up the points set forth by Mr. Lincoln one by one in reverse order of importance. And let us see if we cannot find some mutual point of agreement in each area. I believe my colleagues, Mr. Hunter and Mr. Campbell, will agree with me when I point out that in regard to an immediate cessation of hostilities, President Davis and General Lee would require certain conditions to be fulfilled. talked for four hours there in the riverboat moving gently the Chesapeake swell. If any one of them, Lincoln and Seward from the north, Stevens, Hunter, and Campbell from the south, all good men, if any of them could have spoken what was in his heart, he would have said simply, let us have peace. Yet, 
In the end, it had to be said. My friend, I can see no purpose in talking first. There are ghosts between Burnside dead at Fredericksburg below the sunken road. And the host Lee left forever on Cemetery Ridge. We are what? Not by these men, but by the living they left behind. In the sight of the living, we cannot either of us yield. Not yet. Not yet. So, shall we not go quietly now and leave the decision to the men at arms? I thank you, gentlemen, for your earnest effort to find a grief. Mr. Steve. Yes, Mr. Lincoln. I should like to talk with you for a while before you leave, if I may. So, Alec, we failed. Oh, I'm not so sure, Abe. You know, when I first saw you in Congress and heard your voice so long ago, I said to myself, there's a man who can, if he wills strongly enough and thinks clearly enough and loves deeply enough, there is a man who can move the whole world into the shape of his desire. I think I was not wrong, Minnie. In the end, you will move the world. In the end? But I came here today hoping against hope I might make peace today. No. Oh, what is today? What is now? You and I belong to this now. But surely you know what you said it yourself. Now will very soon have no meaning for us. The pale midget will vanish and no one will remember him. But the grotesque giant will live forever. In his words, in his deeds. In his loving kindness. Soon, Abe, you'll be called upon to speak again. Speak with charity, my friend. I shall speak with charity. And few will heed. But many will remember. I wish I was sure of that. But I shall speak again. Just once more. <laughs> speaking again now on this, the 143rd anniversary of his birth, as he spoke then, on that inaugural day in 1865, when the sun broke through the clouds. And as he shall speak, so long as there are men to read and honor words of wisdom and courage and love. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves, and with all nations. Thanks to Raymond Massey and the Cavalcade players for tonight's story, With Malice Toward None. <laughs> On December 25th, 1776, three words written by George Washington became a battle cry of freedom. Next week, the DuPont Cavalcade will present the exciting story of that fateful night. Our play, Three Words. Our star, Claude Rain. Be sure to listen. Tonight's DuPont Cavalcade with Malice Tordnan 
was written by George H. Faulkner, based on the material from Abraham Lincoln, The War Years, by Carl Sandburg. It is used by permission of Hartford Brace and Company. Original music was composed by Arden Cornwell, conducted by Donald Boyes. The program was directed by John Zoller. In tonight's cast, Raymond Massey starred as Lincoln. John Briggs played Thatcher. Scott Tennyson was heard as Stephen. Your narrator, Cy Harris. Don't forget next week, our star, Claude Ray. The DuPont Cavalcade of America comes to you from the Velasco Theater in New York and is sponsored by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. Makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Next is Adventure on Hollywood Theater on NBC.